learn our language and our corpus. So I think a good starting point is to say, uh, what is a corpus? Because some people know, and some people perhaps are less familiar. So um, a corpus is a large collection of written text or transcribed speech. It's stored electronically, um, it's analyzed and processed using software, and it's the basis for, for many, many things, many research questions. And we see certain things here like um, frequencies, collocations, colligations, grammatical tendencies, changes in speech over time. Uh, these were some of the research projects that I did because um, I did a, an MA in Applied Linguistics and I just finished a few months ago. So um, a famous example is the British National Corpus, which again, it seems to be quite uh, popular with people. Um, it's a kind of a snapshot of language from 1994 and it's been updated again recently. Now these kind of corpora, they take um, many years of work, so it's still 2014, it's only coming online now. <coughs> um, so, for example, the British National Corpus has 100 million words, 90% uh, of it's written and 10% of it's spoken. So, I think, like, I'm a, a, you know, an ELT teacher and I think straight away we can start seeing features that are quite useful for us because if we look at a course book, um, a lot of the texts and the readings and even the listenings, they're often taken from newspaper articles <coughs> or radio, um, radio shows. Um, academic language, I know that some people are promoting uh, academic um, uh, English, so we can see things like reporting verbs, what's going on around those reporting verbs, what uh, sciences the reporting verbs are used most frequently with, and things like that. And then obviously in the spoken part, we can see things like interaction pattern, response tokens. I think uh, the last talk, the, the video um, interaction talk, they were talking a little bit about that as well. So they're all useful things that can inform course books, they can form and from the way we teach too. Um, there's a big one at the moment, uh, I found it very recently, called the iWeb. It's 1.4 billion words. It's very user friendly. I just thought I'd put it up because it's got a nice PDF. Um, if you're feeling a bit adventurous on the way home and you have your tablet, uh, have a go. And you, it's amazing what you can see straight away. Just as a teacher, you're going to start seeing connections and, and things that could be useful for you. So there's something for you to have a look at. I think the slides will be put up, will they, Laura? Mm -hmm. So people can access this later. So if we take the idea of what is a corpus and the structure of a corpus, we can apply it to um, a learner corpus, so a corpus of learner language. And the, the thing I'm going to be speaking about today is the English profile. Um, I use this a lot uh, in my dissertation, so I'll be speaking a little bit about that in, in a while. Um, the, the learner corpus, the English profile, um, as you can see there, it's, it was put together by Cambridge and it's 54 million words of learner language. Uh, it's from the, all the exams, the Cambridge exam, so if you've taught the Cambridge exam or you've done the Cambridge exam in the last 25 years, you're in this, okay, so uh, you gave your consent. Um, it's a lot of, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of um, L1 backgrounds and it covers obviously A1 to C2 and uh, it's hosted on Sketch Engine. Now, um, the Sketch Engine is, uh, you subscribe to it, but um, we can't actually access this because it's only for Cambridge, because they spent a lot of money and a lot of time putting it together, so it's, that's theirs. But I think this is important because um, Anne O'Keefe and Geraldine Mark, they spoke about this at the um, IA Temple and they spoke about it at the ELT plenary last year as well. Um, they have kind of bridged from that research to us as teachers, so they've put together this framework for us that's very, very accessible for a teacher. So it's not this abstract kind of corpus information, it's, it's a framework that we can tune into, and I'll give an example of that in a moment. Um, the objectives of the profile are to describe uh, competencies. So what is the learner doing at each level? Um, it's to supplement as well the European framework. So I don't know if people have studied this, but um, the framework kind of work, harks back to um, work in the 1970s with the Council of Europe, uh, kind of the, the Wilkins kind of uh, notional syllabuses and things like that, kind of very theoretic. Um, this moves from that kind of can-do statement to a more like, okay, statistically this is what the learners are doing, and here's evidence, here's a lot of evidence of that. Um, if you go to the English profile, there are two strands, and uh, it's online and open access, as I said. Uh, you've got the English grammar profile and the English vocabulary profile. <coughs> so, I'm not actually sure how I am for time, but I think... I, I think um, I can only speak about the grammar profile today, you know, um, but the information on the vocabulary profile is on these slides, so if anyone wants to take it and use that as a kind of an inspiration to use it, I, I would hope that uh, you can do that. Um, so, I use the grammar profile a lot in my own research, and um, I'll kind of talk people through a little bit. Um, 
I, I'm not going to do a live demo because it's kind of, uh, it could be a bit fidget, fiddly, but I think um, if you go to, into the uh, English Grammar Profile, you've got your super categories here, and it describes all the grammar features, that from adjectives to verbs, that we're all familiar with, from course books and classes and exams and things like that. And then if you click on one of these, you get a subcategory. And in my case, I was working a lot with modality, as uh, some people uh, saw the talk I did earlier in the year on that. And if you go into modality, you get uh, all of these features of modality. Now, importantly, this is describing what learners are doing. So, um, if you see, for example, um, adjectives communicating a modal meaning, I think that that's something that teachers can immediately start learning about, because it's not something that people would connect, you know? I would always think, yeah, must have to, yeah, of course. But adjectives, I, I didn't know much about that, you know? And adverbs as well, that's unusual. And expressions to, with be. So, um, the, the learners are using it, we're using it too, but perhaps we're not uh, so clear with uh, labeling it, you know? So, um, if we go further into it, um, I'm here, I've clicked modality, I've saw, seen all these, and I've gone, okay, I'm gonna go to wood. And this is what we see. So, we see modality, subcategory wood, level B2, for example, it tells you all the levels all the way down. And then, uh, for example, the function is the habitual past. Use have would to talk about things we did in the past. And if you click here, um, you get a, an excerpt from um, a student exam. So like B2 is FCE, isn't it? So uh, you might get an example from an FCE exam saying, this is a Polish speaker, um, and the exam was uh, you know, 2001, and it gives you the excerpt from it. Um, an interesting thing as well is, if you look at wood, at A1, and if you look at wood, wood at C2, you see how the learners are using it at a different level, more sophisticated level as it goes along. So it's very informative for, for anyone who's working with syllabus, design, course book writing, examinations, and things like that, even just obviously in your own classes. Um, myself, I did a study in my dissertation, and one kind of strand of it was I got the three most frequent models in the British National Corpus, which are will, can, and wood. Okay? And, and they're by far the most commonly used. And I compared the functions in a B1 level course book with the English grammar profile. So um, I have a graphic here, which hopefully can explain it better than, than I could describe it. So we'll start here. There's your Will Cannon Wood. It seems that in the course books, there's a natural kind of a syllabus as to what emerges um, for all the functions of these forms. So that's it there. There are 10 of them in a B1 level course book. And uh, interestingly, I think you'll see in B1, remember, the third conditional is being used by B1 level learners in written exams, which is a bit, a bit of a surprise, I think. And um, then when I checked this against the English grammar profile, uh, what I saw was that a lot of the functions don't correspond. You can see here a lot of them in red. They're, they actually, uh, learners are using them at lower levels. And in some cases, like these two, they're actually using them at higher levels. So straight away, I, I think a conclusion would be that if you're putting together um, a course book series of from A1 to C2, uh, all the typical functions of grammar that we have, I think we can start moving them around. You know, so some, some can go back to lower levels, others can be left forward onto B2, and other ones could be even um, given less kind of emphasis because sometimes uh, a function like this, I know that it's very, very infrequent in natural language, in kind of authentic language, and it's given sometimes one unit in a 12 unit book of grammar. And so that's a lot of emphasis, you know. Um, and then as well, do you remember we were talking about adjectives for modals and adverbs for modals? So perhaps that could be included instead. So it could be great for a restructuring just of, of a course book because I'm emphasizing the course book because I think um, it's a great support for teachers, especially developing teachers and, and busy teachers like myself. I often grab the course book and go, okay, I'll have to trust the grammar in this book to teach the lessons and the levels that I'm doing today. Um, I was thinking as, as a, uh, a kind of a development project to how to get teachers kind of engaged with this because it's a great resource for reference but how can, can we get people using it and I think the issue you were talking about earlier of, of making it a longitudinal is a challenge um, and that's something I've got to think about more <laughs> to be honest right um, but um, you know we could replicate my study where you could designate one of the super categories or the subcategories. Now, I know modality is big, but some of the other ones like discourse markers, it's actually not that big. Or you could designate one of these. Like this would be very interesting to explore just for myself because I'm interested in modality. And um, 
you could get the teachers to you could as as a teachers meeting you could go okay let's get one of the EGP can do statements and start seeing what are the learners doing it in class um, and what are the course books saying how are they correlating and um, because one thing I when I did my uh, research um, I collected also a, a learner corpus of spoken language and I transcribed it and everything it took me quite a long time so you were talking about YouTube YouTube videos. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, you have to do it like by, by yourself. Um, so, for example, uh, productive and receptive knowledge. This is quite obvious for many people, but they were okay. Um, they were uh, able to understand third conditional sentences at B1, but they couldn't even produce wood in any kind of answer. What they did was they used substitution strategies. So they used adjectives and adverbs of modality instead. So it means that the learners were actually using these, and I wasn't aware that they were kind of out there and how useful they could be in B1 level course books as a way of focusing on, have you ever struggled on a Friday afternoon through a third conditional lesson oh, and everyone's okay. sweating and, <laughs> and, and, and it's So how about doing something else? Like, okay, they can match with this. It does have the same communicative function. It is communicating a modal meaning or whatever. Um, another thing as well was, um, uh, spoken and written. So when they had time to write, they seemed to kind of be able to have a go at a conditional sentence. And um, but it seems maybe that there might be a bit of rote learning going on when people are doing Cambridge exams. That's a small suspicion I have. So teachers might be going, okay, learn the structure, put it into your no questions, just put it in, and you'll you'll pass the exam. Kind of a little bit of that. So. Um, if you kind of correlate those things, the EGP, the books, the class, spoken, written, productive, receptive, uh, the course books, um, it could be a way of uh, helping, I'm thinking more of a developing teacher, certainly myself when I was a younger teacher and when I was uh, engaging with these things more. Um, uh, I was thinking of the implications for your teaching, your planning, and your understanding of level as well. So it's, it's more nuanced, isn't it? It's not like um, B1 or inter, upper, inter. There's these kind of grades between them, and there's that differentiation kind of fan going on as well. So does, uh, we have to deal with these things because you're going to have people coming into your classes, and this will, will help us engage with that. Um, the, uh, kind of, um, the consequences, I would hope, from that would be that people can um, develop their language awareness because there's too much focus on raw grammar, on form focus, gap fill, no functional uh, communicative uh, feeling to it, where if it gets into a functional approach, um, it's more useful. You're engaging what your students need in the class. And um, that's what the English profile gives you. It breaks the grammar down into functions. And that way, it's a lot more practical and it's uh, easier for students to use too. Um, it gets people using observing learner language um, in a corpus and in the classroom too. And I would hope that something like that could uh, get people to kind of look under the bonnet of a course book and maybe not trust it so much and be more confident about adapting and supplementing and to be more confident with their own language awareness while doing so. And Last but not least, uh, don't be afraid of the corpora. It's not a monster that's going to be or anything like that. It's, got, it's very useful and it's a, it's a basic um, kind of contact point for teachers and it's a way for, uh, to bridge research and the ELT community because I feel that that's definitely not being done enough.